So we're now going to be looking at the year in review. Just to tell you, please send in questions. Let's also have our first little yellow hand up and, and we'll open up the microphone after we've heard from Atali and Bruno. Um, we're looking really back on the last year from the perspective of the uh, GLC support team, some numbers, some trends, and well, it's been a year like no other. So Atali, what sort of trends have you seen when you're actually looking at the way that the GLC support team can support um, operations? You, you, are you seeing patterns emerging? Thanks, Cathy. And I should start off by saying we had a bit of a debate as to whether we should do death by PowerPoint on this one or just do it a free flow. So I apologise to everybody if they see a bit too much of uh, myself and Bruno, but we'll, we'll go through it. So we were going to kind of um, look back in different chunks of the activities from the, the support team. As I mentioned earlier in the SAG call, we, we want to try and make sure that everybody's aware of what we've been up doing, you know, that uh, you get an idea that it's um, hopefully in line. We try to keep as far in line with the needs, both on the ground and of the partners at a global level as possible. So uh, if I can look back at a few reflections on the operational support from the team to the country operations and global activities. The first thing to say is that 2020, I think we reached the highest number of concurrent IASC formal activated logistics cluster. So by the end of the year, we were supporting 13 formal activations as well as um, other sectoral coordination mechanisms. So just to give you a feel, of course, they're all different in shape, size, and, and concept of operations, but it was the peak of uh, LC operations. And I think for us, uh, and we, within that 13, I think we had four new activations during the course of the year. And I think uh, for us and perhaps for many of our, our, our partners out there, our default setting when providing support to the field at short notice is to kind of pack our toothbrush and passport and get out there. Whereas, of course, last year we had to slightly adjust that approach. And we did still manage to have a number of, of colleagues deployed in support of operations. I think we clocked up about 349 days on the ground, which was less than previous years, but fortunately we did still manage to get out Afghanistan, Armenia, Bangladesh, Burkina Faso, Colombia, Honduras, Iraq, Mexico, and Panama. So that's both the formal activations and the sectoral coordination mechanisms and other no regrets deployments. But, of course, we had to adapt the way that we did things. And one of the trends, if you like, I'm not sure if it's too early to identify a trend, but one of the ways in which we had to adapt was by looking at opportunities for remote support, whether that be remote dedicated support to an operation. And in some instances, we were actually doing, for example, coordination of the in-country meetings remotely, or IM support to the meetings remotely. Um, and also, of course, increasing the support to colleagues in, in the field when perhaps they got stuck for months on end, not being able to get out on R&R, &R, and they might have had certain gaps in, in the staffing there. So one trend, of course, was how we managed to use remote support effectively. Of course, it was a learning experience, but, and we hope that was effective. I'm going to slow down a bit. I've just realized I'm giving the poor ladies in translation a complete nightmare. Sorry about that. <laughs> so a third point to touch on is uh, the evolution or the development and ad adaptation of what we call the gaps and needs assessments. And this is something that we've really been investing a lot of time in because we see it as a useful way of consistently hearing from partners in a country and hearing what their gaps actually are and consequently their needs. And this really helps us to try to uh, have a consistent and predictable approach across the different country operations. So a lot of effort's been going into continuously evolving that. And again, the online aspect of this has perhaps meant we've managed to include more partners' voices in that. They haven't had to travel from, I don't know, Janena to Khartoum. They've been able to dial in directly. So I hope that's actually been beneficial. And we had, I'm just checking the numbers here, 12 GNAs carried out in 2020. Afghanistan, Burkina, Burundi, Colombia, Ecuador, Haiti, Honduras, Libya, Mozambique, Sudan, 
Venezuela and Yemen. And those GNAs are useful at many different stages in the process, i.e. they can help understand whether or not a formal logistics cluster activation is uh, to the benefit of the partner community. They can be used during the life cycle of the cluster operation to help see if there needs to be a change in the concept of operations. And of course, they can be used to help understand the transitional options for coming out of a formal activation. So the third trend was really looking at how we can improve the GNAs. Kathy, am I going a bit too fast? Tell me if I'm galloping. Uh, I sometimes lose track of myself. I've got a few more if that's OK. No, carry on, carry on. <laughs> Um, it'll be over soon, sorry for that everyone. Um, one other thing, the fourth point that I was thinking of was, you know, identifying and learning from lessons is clearly really critical and it was embedded in the strategy implementation uh, process. We did find over the course of the year, and perhaps that's because the balance of people's time in terms of operational response and other activities was hit by COVID-19, but we did see during the course of the year that perhaps it would be useful to have a more agile and timely approach to identifying and learning from lessons in the field, so that particularly if the operation is ongoing so that it can help shape the response rather than perhaps be a, a, a sort of record for posterity. So we're still looking at that and hopefully it's something we can discuss more later this week. How can we really make sure that the balance between time invested and the utility of the product is right? And I think Teo alluded to that in the SAG session about how can we make sure things are not too time heavy. So that's the comment on uh, lessons learned. I think another clear one that was on everybody's mind last year is, as a logistics cluster, how do we best uh, adapt to support in a context where we may have other coordination mechanisms either um, being developed or, uh, or uh, increasing their role because of, a, 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 because of the context whether that be at global, regional, or country level. So again, I think that's another question that we can learn from the events of COVID-19 last year and think about how that impacts to the strategy moving forward. And I think um, Fabrice, I think you mentioned it just now in the psych update as well. One of the things that we probably really want to pick up again this year is looking at the working groups and how we can uh, engage partners. I know it's an extra workload, sorry for that, but how we can have those collaborative uh, fora where we can look at key issues. I'm thinking particularly of service provision off the top of my head, but looking at how we can pick up working groups and use those to drive forward uh, the development of the strategy and really tightening up the processes uh, and systems we've got, again, for that predictability and consistency. And I'm sorry to be greedy with the mic, um, Kathy and everybody, but one final point from 2020 uh, and the operational angle is about preparedness and what it's like trying to, trying to carry out preparedness activities in the middle of an operational response. And I imagine it would be no surprise to everybody that it's difficult to initiate a preparedness activity when all the in-country stakeholders are fully engaged on an operational response. But equally, we really saw the clear benefit of the preparedness activities in those countries where they'd already managed to make some headway and had established their processes, they'd established their working groups, etc. And we're going to hear a little bit more um, from colleagues about the field-based preparedness project later in the week. So sorry, that's a bit of a gallop through, but those are sort of the, the six or seven points, I think, looking back at the operational support um, from the, the support cell or support team over the course of the year. And I think, Bruno, you're going to share some thoughts on other aspects, i.e. the information. I'll be quiet. Sorry, Cathy. No, well, let me let me just come in because I also just want to say to everybody, please ask uh, send us any questions if you have any at this point on Menti Mentimeter, or you can ask to put your hand up. Um, I, that's or I already have some questions for Atali, but I'll ask them l later because yes, we want to talk to Bruno. Um, and if we're talking about change in this meeting and we're talking about particularly for instance digitalization but then we hear from Atali there about the increase 
requests for operational support, it's quite difficult to drive the other initiatives forward while you're having to deal with the with the you know the actual day-to-day uh, -day operations. So, uh, how how do you get that balance right? Thanks, Cathy. That's that's a, a very difficult question. It's it's actually a rebu rebuilding a car as you're driving it, and I think a lot of the colleagues online have that experience time and again, uh, especially with the unpredictability of, of, of operational requirements and emergencies coming on on that. Uh, and it is, it is indeed a challenge to keep the strategic outlook uh, also for a logistics cluster and a community of partners uh, while constantly having to, to, to be ready to, to respond to, to all the challenges. Uh, but there again, I think it comes to, to the point of communication uh, and exchange among the partnership in making sure uh, that we are as, as complementary as possible, uh, that we are assuring that we have as, as little uh, um, um, overlaps uh, as possible. And, and it, it was a good point, it was a good question that was raised before as well. No? We do this with the other clusters as well. We have very regular conversations with the other clusters, whether it's in one of these uh, abbreviations, which I will not be repeating, uh, uh, or just in, in bilateral phone calls. Um, we, we constantly try to keep abreast uh, with what is happening. Uh, and the same with, with a lot of the initiatives that, that partners are doing. So we try to constantly uh, work on that. Um, and I think it's important, if, if, if I may, uh, uh, Cathy, uh, I think it's important to, to note the, 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 the pivotality of, of data uh, and, and data points in, in all of these exchanges. Uh, because I think that's probably one of the biggest uh, changes that we're seeing uh, over the last few years and probably going to be for the, for the years to come as well. The number of data points, the, number, uh, the, the vast amount of data which is available is constantly growing. By the day, by the minute, by the second, there's more data available. Uh, there's no lack of data. I think uh, uh, there's more uh, a, the challenge of how to create that connectivity between data and how to analyze that data. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say, actually, that uh, I, I hope at least that Logistics Cluster is trying to, to step up on that uh, and to provide a lot of that analysis and that creation. Uh, we've got a few initiatives uh, on that, uh, maybe first and foremost, uh, and just in the last few days, we launched a new Logistics Cluster website. Uh, after having said, uh, after having noticed that over the last year, 2020, there were over one million unique visits to the logistics cluster website uh, and the new website which is going to be uh, explained shortly tomorrow and then more extensively on Thursday um, is really aimed at, at, at creating an even better user experience and, and making sure that that added value of information so it's not only providing data but the added value of analysis the added value of, of information and I think Cathy as a journalist you can for sure connect with this uh, it's not only about numbers and data it's really about the analysis which is coming out of, out of it which is important and the website is one initiative. Uh, uh, another initiative, of course, that most of us know is LogIE, uh, or formerly known as the Preparedness Platform. Uh, also, uh, in, the, in the starting blocks uh, these days, uh, some of you have already had a, a appetizer on it. Uh, I hope many more will be seeing it and that we can see how this is going to be rolled out to an overarching uh, and overall uh, uh, tool. Um, but, but yeah, and, and going back a little bit to that point of data, Cathy, um, it's not only about the data that we have within the humanitarian system. And, and actually, you were referring correctly to, to the gaps and needs assessments that we did over the last year, the 12 gaps and needs assessments we did over the last year. These gaps and needs assessments are not only including the data that we gather from humanitarian community. This is not only the data we get out of RITA, one of our own software systems, not only getting out of the bilateral conversations we have through the interviews uh, that, that the entire team has with, with, with teams of, of, of all the colleagues on the, on the call. There's also a big chunk of information which we are gathering from the private sector. Uh, and there's also a big chunk that we are getting out of analysis which is done with the academic sector as well. So 
the, the picture is, is, is getting fuller and fuller on, on, on the data gathering and, and, and we, we, we are working more and more on how we could work on, the, on that analysis with all these different partners uh, and sectors. And, and I was referring to the private sector before and that's maybe also a tool that we would really like to highlight and make a short reference both tomorrow and Friday. Uh, in this case, this is a session then on Friday, is Eduardo. Uh, yes, everybody knows we love our ab acronyms and we love our abbreviations, but let's just call it Eduardo and I will not say what it stands for. Um, but Eduardo is a tool which was really created by the private sector partners of the logistics cluster to answer to questions that we, we, we understood were coming out of the community of partners. Uh, it's, 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 it's providing visibility on potential flight data, on cargo opportunities, air cargo opportunities uh, uh, on, on the market in a post-emergency uh, post phase uh, when, when normal uh, operations have come, come to, a cease, uh, to, to, to a stop. So, and, and, and there again, there we see that the private sector has brought in the data, we brought in some of the data and the knowledge that we can bring in from the humanitarian community, and then together uh, it, it created that Eduardo platform. Uh, Loggy is doing the same, it's a mixture of all these different data sources. Uh, and and yeah, Cathy, I, I don't know whether the, word is, the correct word is digitization or digitalization, I have no idea what it is, I, I leave that in the middle, I'm not a linguist. Um, but yeah, it's it's it's... It's, it, it's becoming a bigger and a bigger role, and I don't want to put uh, Marion in, on, on the spot on that one, but uh, for those who are not aware, there's still a very initi uh, important initiative uh, on the frontline humanitarian logistics, which is very much about how to communicate, uh, have that linkage, that communication between data points now. Uh, and then, of course, uh, I would also like to refer a little bit to, to, to uh, how, how is digitization uh, operationalized. And we have a very interesting speaker uh, in, in, in a few moments, Professor Ndemo, uh, who is going to be diving into that as well. Kathy. Well, thank you very much indeed. No, digitization and digitalization, I'm never totally sure which one it is, but we know what you mean. We know what you mean. I love the fact that Bruno talks about rebuilding a car when you're driving it. We've been teasing him the lot, lot, when we've been planning this meeting about all his use of analogies and, and metaphors. It's wonderful. We love it. Um, let's talk about the partnership base now, um, for both of you, Atalie first. Um, how Well, obviously, the interaction has changed dramatically um, in the sense of having to do a lot more remote stuff. But um, tell us what, what you've learned from that over the last 12 months. Well, it might be a very kind of basic observation, but one thing is that clearly people had a lot less time last year. And so we're very conscious about not overloading people with additional <laughs> exchanges, perhaps on broader topics when they were, you know, firefighting on the operational response. So although it sounds very basic, I think really the... the, the constraints people had on the time that they had available last year. I should, I should thank the SAG here. They, they alluded to the amount of time we had uh, meetings early on in COVID-19, and it really is a, a, an investment um, and a commitment that's made when people are so busy with their, their day jobs, as I think you referred to it before. So time really meant that perhaps we didn't have so many opportunities for exchange on the broader topics. I mean, for example, we, we had to uh, skip the, uh, the spring meeting last year and I, and I think, of course, that everybody um, would rather have the face-to-face -face meetings that we, we used to have. Um, and I personally, I think a lot of that is because it's harder to have less structured um, exchanges when you're online. It feels a little bit more uh, arranged or programmed. And I think that's one of the things that we miss from the face-to-face -face, is being able to build up those broader understandings about each other's um, daily realities when you have a more casual exchange face to face um, but of course you know I'm ever the naive optimist I really hope we can we can get over that hurdle and keep trying to find ways it might be a bit painful having an ad hoc conversation on zoom um, starting cold but um, you know I, I think bit by bit we need to get a bit more used to it I mean even my mum's managed to use WhatsApp these days which is a, a bit of a, a miracle she hasn't quite got around to Skype but nonetheless and if my mum can do it then I think all of us can get around to it and I'm looking to my left I have Bruno the uncrowned king of communication on all means and methods so over to Bruno for his thoughts on how how difficult or easy it's been to connect with with everyone over the last year Bruno, keep it, could you keep it quite short, only because we've got some questions coming in and we want to get to those? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, 
Yes, I think the informal communication has increased substantially. I'm a very bad example at home of constantly having WhatsApp uh, in my hand while at the dinner table. So that's not necessarily a recommendation I would make to everybody. Um, and, and yes, indeed, we, we, we change from three-dimensional meetings to two-dimensional uh, phone calls, and we always have to plan them in. Um, however, I do think that because of the broadening of the network, the interconnectedness is easier to establish. It's easier to connect people. Uh, because of the technical uh, uh, options and facilities which are there, whether it's now today on Zoom or, or any of the other platforms that, that we all know about, uh, I think where, where the strength of the network of the logistics cluster comes through is to adding value to just making a connection. It's not just saying I'm connecting A to B. It's connecting A to B because of a reason and giving a background and, 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 and kind of vouching for the content of that connection as well. So I think that's a very much uh, uh, the added value that we bring to that. And maybe one point that I would like to share on, to, to add on that, I'm sorry, Cathy, uh, I'm, 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 I'm messing up the schedule on that one. Um, is uh, because it was referred to in the previous questions as well, is the staff turnover. And staff turnover, I think, is, 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 is a topic. I, I think Alex Marinelli referred to it, a question before I was referring to it. Um, how are we going to keep that knowledge? How are we going to keep that knowledge when people move on with their careers, move on in other sectors, come in from other sectors? Of course, we have new generations, and I'm happy to see that there's a lot of uh, new and upcoming talent on the call as well. And I think there we need to see on how we're going to make sure that we also use digitization on making sure that we have the capacity strengthening options uh, open and available for every, uh, everybody. Uh, uh, for those who have been using, following our social media accounts, we, we did the first, uh, first of its kind uh, uh, virtual reality simulation uh, uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, uh, for those who, who know the old-fashioned, uh, not the old-fashioned, uh, those who know the old uh, uh, LRT, uh, now the LRT has gone digital uh, and virtual reality. Uh, uh, and, and, and then a lot of the work that the colleagues are doing on the online trainings is very much about how how to create that knowledge transfer continuously uh, and making sure that every new generation which is coming in, every new participant to the community is coming in, they get on top as soon as possible. Sorry, Cathy. I'll no, 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 it's important. Um, we'll just take the top question and then we'll move on to finance because we, we're going to talk about that. But um, just, uh, um, just one thing, just to check that somebody wanted to know that the URL is the same on the new website. So yes or no? Yes. Yes, we stay at logcluster.org. Fine, thank you. That's okay. Um, so the question here is, what are the KPIs established to determine the success of the logistics cluster? Who is in charge and responsible for the results? So what, how do you assess how, um, how successful the cluster is? Atali, do you have any thoughts? I've got a few, but Bruno is jumping on fingers on the buzzer here. <laughs> I wouldn't say that I'm trying to put fingers on the buzzer. I think it's, 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 it's a very good question, but a very complicated question to answer. Because the logistics cluster is not a one-faceted topic. It's not a one-faceted uh, uh, um, activity with a single outcome or a single output for that matter. What is the KPI of a network? Is that attendance to this meeting, for instance, 204 people? Is it active attendance to this meeting? Uh, that might be hopefully also 204, but maybe it might be slightly less. So let's, let's agree on 198. Um, what is the KPI for, for um, um, reducing a gap uh, in the humanitarian system by provision of information? Uh, how do you measure that without that piece of information? How would you have done it? So the KPI setting is an extremely important uh, question, uh, which we would really like to engage upon with the broader partnership again, uh, uh, also in light of, of the upcoming strategy conversations that we are having. And we are also having it with a number of academic partners uh, who are literally combing through meeting minutes, combing through uh, all the public data on the websites that we have and trying to provide us some of the data analysis is there again on providing that KPI. But uh, uh, the, the, big, the big question is the KPI on what aspect of the logistics cluster would, would be actually the counter question to that, Cathy. Right, yeah, no, it is complex quite clearly. Um, never time to really answer these questions in full, but anyway, that, that, that uh, I'm sure went some way towards it. Thank you.